Our presenter today is not new to the group. He's been here a few times before. He's Professor Jeff Troxell, and he recently retired after serving in the Army and with the Department of Army for 44 years. He spent 18 years on the faculty of the United States Army War College, and his last position was as research professor of national security and military strategy with the Strategic Studies Institute. Prior duties include stints with the Center for Strategic Leadership and in the Department of National Security and Strategy. His teaching and research focus has been on U.S. defense policy and economics. For the past 17 years, while on the War College faculty, he taught an elective course on economics of national security and has widely lectured on related topics. He earned a bachelor's degree from the United States Military Academy in 1974 and a master's degree from the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton University in 1982 and is a 1997 graduate of the United States Army War College. During a 30-year career as an Army engineer, his higher-level assignments included War Plans Division, Department of the Army from 1990 to 1992, as a force planner for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Requirements in the Office of the Secretary of Defense from 1994 to 1996, and commander of the 3rd Engineer Battalion, 24th Infantry Division. Please join me in welcoming Professor Troxell back. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, now they are, they're supposed to turn me on, so, uh, Wait, I'm supposed to turn you on, so you're going to pay attention to what I have to say here. Something like that. But can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Is it? All right, good. So uh, if, if some of you back there, you know, have this sense of deja vu flowing over you, it's, it's, not, it's not the HVAC system, it's not age or anything like that. I have uh, been here, done this before. So this is actually the, the trade policy trifecta. I gave a talk on trade two years ago and three years before that. So this is either going to be three strikes and I'm out, <laughs> or I'm hoping it's this way. Third time's the charm. <laughs> so hopefully we're going to get the third time's the charm here in this particular talk. So we'll, we'll see. You, you can be the judge of that. All right, so here's my agenda. Uh, this Actually, the, uh, the good news is this topic is much less complicated than Michael's email struggles. So, you know, we should be able to, we should be able to get through this without any problem. Uh, we're going to talk about China and trade theory and practice a little bit, just to set the context. So there is no talk this year in the Great Decisions Program specifically directed at China. So I'm going to spend a, probably a little bit more time talking about China, and some of that's provi pro uh, providing the context, and then I'll do a little bit of review about trade. You know, just think about it. Neither one of these issues is that important today, so we're going to put them both together <laughs> in one session. That's my challenge. And then, uh, then we're going to talk about this U.S.-China trade. And so we're going to see how that works out. Now, I don't know exactly why these two gentlemen have got such big smiles on their face. So this is when they cut this deal, this, the truce that they reached on the 1st of December to say, okay, we're going to hold off on additional tariffs and we're going to negotiate. So my hope is that either at the end of this month, although uh, the president just said yesterday he is not planning to meet with Xi Jinping before the 1st of March, and that's the deadline on this current negotiation. Uh, their next scheduled meeting, I think, is uh, at another G20 session sometime in June. So that may change. But I'm hoping that whenever the two of them get together, they're still smiling, because that may be a good thing for all of us. But we'll see how that plays out. OK, so I don't, uh, as Michael said, I'm retired. So I don't really need a disclaimer, because nobody <laughs> cares what I say anymore. But, but the other thing about the disclaimer to think about here, um, you know, there's a wide spectrum of views on all of these topics. Anything on China, I mean, you can, there are new books coming out every day and a lot, lots of good material out there. There's lots of different views on trade. So if there's something I say that you're back there and you start scratching your head and you say, I don't think that's right, you are probably correct. It may not be right, but it's just coming from my perspective. So just recognize that, that there's wide, wide views on all of these topics. Okay, so we're going to start with China. 
China's position in the world. And the author, uh, Jeremy Happ, you know, sort of talks about that. And he sort of relates this as, a, you know, this is a David uh, Goliath type thing. And um, China is the Goliath in this when China rules the war. And uh, David's, this is the US. We're struggling against China. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to view China. How big is China from the standpoint of its relationships with the United States? So when you think about economic power, we used to have this concept called commanding heights. Actually, it was Lenin that coined the phrase when he was talking about the new economic policy in the brand new Soviet Union. And he says, we're going to control the commanding heights. So one way to think about economic power is what are the commanding heights? So this is what we used to think about, commanding heights. So uh, anybody know where this is? All right, just in case you needed a hint. Pittsburgh, all right, so this is Pittsburgh. So uh, that's too bad, you know, can, can you believe it? The year that they actually beat the Patriots in the regular season, they didn't even make the playoffs. But at any rate, so you can, and you can get an idea why these commanding heights are important. So steel used to be a critical industry across the world. And it was really a mark of the arrival of the US as a superpower. And you know, it's easy to figure out. You know, you can translate steel into direct military uses, requirements, and so that was one of those issues. Well, when we think about steel production today, it's China. And so this is part of the, part of the trade issue here in terms of China now produces or last year, I think the numbers were 923 metric tons of steel. The United States, down here, this blue sliver, about 90 million metric tons. So China is 10 times greater when it comes to that. And so, so you can think about this notion about, well, China certainly has arrived, at least from the standpoint of this old notion of commanding heights. And we're going to come back to this notion of commanding heights, too. OK, but there are other ways to measure broader measures. And it's important to try to get an idea of China, US, and, and relative strengths. And so we're going to I'm going to talk about this uh, <clears throat> hopefully pretty briefly, because the author in the article uh, talks about this too. So there's economic measures, direct economic measures, gross domestic product. The Bureau of Economic Analysis and the IMF uh, does a, a lot of work on that. There's national wealth. And you can get this from Credit Suisse is probably the number one uh, analytical place and the World Bank. You can look at military power, and then there's some comprehensive measures. And this is out of the uh, National Economic Council Global Trends 2030. So we're going to look at, at those you know, three broad categories just pretty briefly, but just to plant in your mind that when you think about some of these statistics and data that are presented out there, there are problems with virtually all of them. OK, so gross domestic product. So this is just the quick uh, rundown on where we stand today. US from a nominal perspective, meaning uh, official exchange rate perspective, we are clearly the number one economy, $20 trillion. China is about 70% of that. Remember that number. You know, Not that there's going to be a test, but we're going to come back to, to, to thinking about that 70%. Number two, Japan's number three. And then we'll, uh, I'll talk about this in just a little bit. GDP at purchasing power parity is just another way to compare these economies. And so you just get to see where the lineup is. Uh, it's interesting on purchasing power parity, that's where China clearly becomes the number one economy, if you want to use that measure. Uh, number three, by the way, on purchasing power parity, anybody have an idea? India. India is number three. Uh, so you can get a, a little bit of an idea why the Indo-Pacific region is so important to the United States from a strategic perspective. OK, but there are problems with this gross domestic product. It's an old measure invented in the 1930s by John Maynard Keynes, trying to work on macroeconomic policy issues, very much focused on manufacturing, not services. So we're a much more service-related economy today. So you know it's hard to measure those sorts of things. Uh, it was focused on things that you can drop on your feet on quantity and not necessarily quality. And nowadays, as you, can, as you can think about that, I mean, we're using the same kind of products we used before, but the quality has gone up tremendously. Well, how do you add that in the GDP? It's hard to do that. And so this leads to some problems when you focus on quantity, excess production, and unforeseen externalities, negative consequences. It doesn't recognize the informal economy, and the statistics can be bad. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. 
And then there's this notion about purchasing power parity. So purchasing power parity is this concept that says if you really want to compare economies, you've got to recognize that a dollar that you spend in the United States can buy you a lot more if you're spending that same dollar's worth of currency in China or India or some of these other countries. So typically, a developed country, a more wealthy country, your currency is more valuable. If you had that same level of wealth in a less developed country, you could actually do more with it. And so that's what this, you know, you get this basket of goods and you figure out that in reality, the relative value of the Chinese economy and purchasing power parity is greater than the United States. And there are a lot of problems with that, but that's just the notion. And so just to show you some of it, and I know it's, you, you probably can't read this chart here, but this is a, a recent analysis from January 2019 from the American Enterprise Institute. And so this uh, gentleman, uh, Derek Scissors, is looking at all these measures, indicators of economic growth, and this data column here, the quality of data, borderline useless, low, 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 borderline useless, borderline useless. You know, oh, here's high. We got one high, which is money supply, but it really doesn't matter that much. So that's just to make the point that in China, they say that the number one manufacturing industry in China is economic statistics. <laughs> so you just got to deal with that. But in reality, we're, we're sort of left with that. You know, even in the United States, when we do our GDP numbers, We'll publish a GDP number, and then the next month or the next quarter, they'll come out and they'll say, oh, we're, here's the, adjust, the adjusted number. So it's either a little bit higher than we thought or maybe a little bit lower than we thought. All those numbers can change because most of them are based on surveys. So all of that can change. So there's a lot of inaccuracies associated with this. So as the author in, the, in our chapter for today says, oh, we ought to look at national wealth. So here is some analysis on national wealth. And if you remember, this is coming from uh, Credit Suisse, and they do the most analysis on national wealth. The World Bank does some as well. And you get an idea that, you know, here's this rise of China, even from a national wealth perspective. So you look here in 2018, so the United States is clearly much further ahead of China, almost double China's national wealth, when you look at it from a, from a wealth perspective. But still, China is clearly the number two power. And so one of the things to look at, this is wealth looks at all national assets minus liabilities. Uh, it includes human resources, natural resources, capital, and technological advances. So as the author auger argues, this may be a better measure. It's not that widely used, but it's just one of those things out there. But in reality, from a relative perspective, you know, the United States is number one, China's number two. The margin may be greater, but we still have that situation going on. Wealth represents a stock, a portfolio of assets. GDP is really the return on that. It's a flow. It's a flow number every year. Wealth is a stock of, of what you've accumulated. So that's just another way to look at it. Um, but even in this wealth measure, you know, it's not, we are much further ahead than China, but the catch up is taking place. So this is analysis from the World Bank. So the black bar represents 2017, the yellow, whatever, orange bar represents 2027. And you can see that the projection is China is catching up. So that's sort of the bottom line on, on a couple of these measures. Now, economic power really helps enable military power. So that's another thing that you can look at as an outgrowth of your growing economy. And so that's clearly uh, demonstrated here. This just came out in January from the Defense Intelligence Agency, China Military Power. You get to see that it's growing. This is in billions of dollars. Now, the, the latest, they go to 2018. Most of the analysis goes to 2017. And they say, well, even that number is not necessarily accurate. Because what it, it, it doesn't include in China, their military uh, budget doesn't include R&D, doesn't include foreign military uh, purchases of military equipment. So they say that number is probably a lot closer to $190 billion. And you get to see that just shows you, that line across there just shows you the percent of GDP. So when you look at that relative to the United States, now our margin of uh, excellence, I guess you could say, is much, much greater. So this is, this is 2016 figures, I think, from the Peterson uh, uh, Institute. 
And $610 billion, I think we're looking at a $700 billion defense budget, so we are clearly outspending them. But you look at trends again. So this is looking, you know, and, and you gotta you gotta also recognize that when you look at at trends, future projections, there's all kinds of assumptions built in there, and they may not play out. And we're gonna we're gonna look at an example of that uh, towards the end of this presentation. But this shows you that wow, if all these projections on growth and spending on defense expenditure play out that were used in this study, China is gonna surpass us in an aggregate amount. You know, that's one of the reasons why it's nice to be old. It's not our problem. Somebody else will have to worry about that. But, so that's military power. And then if you want to look at multi-component. All right, let's put it all together here. So this is a study done. This is Global Trends 2030. It was done in 2012, uh, uh, done by the National Intelligence Council. And so this looks at all of these different factors, GDP, population, military, uh, health, education, demography, uh, soft power, all this kind of stuff. And this shows, even this shows, the trend is that China is eventually going to outpace the United States. So it's rising very rapidly and is going to outpace the United States. The other conclusion that they make is economic strength is the enabling ingredient. It's the foundation of national power. This administration has stated in numerous documents that economic security equals national security. <clears throat> so we're going to get back to this uh, issue about the economy. OK, so if you're tired of looking at data and thinking about that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, they say. So this is, uh, this is the Bund in, in Shanghai. This is the uh, Hugong River. And uh, this is the Pudong area. So that's what it looked like in 1990. 20 years later, there it is. Now you see a couple little uh, sky cranes there. Seven years later, the sky cranes are all gone. So there you go. That's the rise of China from the perspective. You know, just that's in Shanghai. So you know, it's not all Shanghai. There's lots of other areas out there in China, but that just gives you a perspective on the growth of China. So now another way to, another way to consider that, and I'm going to go back to GDP. I know the author makes uh, an argument as to uh, why he doesn't prefer the use of that, but everybody's using it. I mean, it's the, the most common measure, and I think it's one that we really have to work with. And this just shows you the rise of China relative to all these other major economic powers. The projection is out here around you know, 2015 or so that China's going to overtake the United States. This has shown GDP and purchasing power parity. So that's what, in fact, is happening with China. A couple dates to think about down, down across the bottom. 1976, uh, what's the best thing that Mao did for China? He died. <laughs> he died and got out of the way. And so that's 1976. Deng Xiaoping comes in. 1979 is the economic reforms. This is the 40th anniversary of that. China's got a big, big celebration getting ready to do for their 40th anniversary of their economic reforms. Uh, 1989. What's 1989? Tiananmen. Tiananmen. No big celebration in China about that. You know, 30th anniversary, they're not, they're not going to get too excited about it. But this is a big deal. You think about the US opening with China in 1972. You know, we were selling the military equipment. We were really working this relationship until 1989. And a lot of that got put back, particularly from a security perspective, got put back on the, on the back burner. Uh, 1997, the Asian financial crisis. That's a big deal when we think about US policy throughout the East, East Asia Pacific region. And certainly uh, created some uh, influence on China. 2001, China's entry into the WTO. Nowadays, I mean nowadays very recently within the last year or so, there's a lot of discussion about that. People are thinking maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't have. 12 year, it was a 12 year negotiation to try to get them into the WTO and a lot of concerns. And then 2008, the global financial crisis. So when you think about the rise of China, 
you know, it sort of corresponds with this global financial crisis, this big crisis for capitalism, and really has created a change in outlook for the Chinese leadership. A much more assertive, much more aggressive after the global financial crisis and after the, uh, the, uh, the arrival of Xi Jinping in 2012. Okay, and then when you think about it from a, a probably a broader geopolitical perspective, you could say that, well, maybe this is not the rise of China, it's just the return of China. So you go back to 1000 AD, this is the, the uh, center of gravity for global economic power. <clears throat> you go through this period here, 1820 to 1913, this is the Industrial Revolution, where the European nations really started to take off. It's also noted in China as the century of humiliation, the, the Opium Wars one and two, and, uh, and now it's starting to go back the other way, going back fairly rapidly towards China again. So that just is another depiction of the growth. All right, so we'll go back to GDP, and, and I want to spend just a little bit of time on this because I think it's important to uh, get some some issues on the table about the Chinese economy. So you all remember from your econ class 101, finally remember, I'm sure you do, what GDP is, consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. So here's how that breaks out. You know, I showed you the, uh, the, the aggregate numbers earlier, but these are the different components. This is important as well, population. You know, China is about four times bigger than the United States. The fertility rate, this is really interesting. Uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. And then the per capita, GDP per capita. I mean, this gives you an idea that, you know, despite this purchasing power paradigm, or even the fact that China is within 30% on a nominal exchange rate of the U.S. economy, they are a much poorer country when you think about it from a per capita standpoint. And I think that's important because if, if a nation needs to do something, needs to do a big project, a big mobilization, or whatever it is, the, the wealthier it is, its citizens are, theoretically at any rate, the easier it would be to mobilize those resources to accomplish what you, you need to accomplish. We're going to see, you know, we're talking about infrastructure programs and stuff in the United States. We're going to see how easy it is to mobilize resources out of our population. But that's the theory. So... Uh, the issue up here that I highlighted in red, I mean, this, this line here for the United States, that's about what it looks like for most developed countries. Consumer-based economy. China, not so much. Really, a lot of their economic strength is coming from investment. So they are unbalanced. They've got an unbalanced economy. So, you know, we used to talk about this uh, rebalance to the Pacific. Well, the Chinese economy needs to rebalance as well. So that's one of the issues here. So you've got this household spending dropped. It's starting to come back up again. I mean, this picture's changing. And all of these things that I talk about the Chinese economy, you know, they're not, they're not state secrets. The Chinese know all of this, and they recognize some of the things they need to do. So it's unbalanced, too much on investment. And that investment is driven by the state-owned enterprises, particularly the banking system that's funneling more and more credit into investment. And that creates problems. The other thing to think about China is this dual identity issue here. And the dual identity issue applies in two aspects. The first is, you know, we think China's the number two economy in the world. They're a developed country. China says, no, we're still developing. And when you think about that, that's probably the case. So here's the extreme poverty rate in China. Uh, so when you look at this decline over the years, we're down here, and unfortunately I cut off the, uh, the index to give you those different years, but we're down here to the current time frame, 12% of the Chinese population is still in extreme poverty. That's a huge accomplishment. Oh, there it is, I, I missed it. All right, so from 81 to 2010. From 81 to 2010, a huge decrease in extreme poverty. Wow, you know, pat them on the back. But they still have 12%. 12% of 1.4 billion people is 150 million people. That's almost half of our entire country in extreme poverty. That's part of this dual identity. They do have economic strength, and they have grown economically, but they still have big problems. 
The other thing about the dual identity is we think about the reforms that have already taken place. Remember I said the best thing that happened that Mao did for China was he died and got out of the way. So there have been tremendous economic reforms. And we think about them as a market-based economy. Well, maybe not so much. So they've got market-based economy, but they still have a state-owned enterprise, SOE, state-owned section of their economy. And it's, it's not as large. The market-based, the private sector is much larger than the, than, the, than the state sector. But this is what gets all the emphasis. And in fact, it's interesting, Xi Jinping has even increased the emphasis on the state sector of their economy. And it's not just big businesses like the steel industry. It's also the banking sector is very important. So dual identity, rich country, poor country, market-based, state-run economy. So that's the dual identity uh, notion there. And then the other thing to consider, very different, obviously, than the United States from a political economy perspective. How does a nation make its major decisions? Based on the market, economic principles, or based on state decisions. So this is really, obviously, a state-run organization, the Chinese Communist Party. And so the political economy is vastly different. All right, so when we look at growth, uh, you know, this is a big issue right now, that Chinese growth is slowing down. You know, we'd love to have 6%, but it's not really too good when you've got the, the kind of issues that they have. And we don't know what that number is again. That's the other thing about these numbers. This is manufactured, to a certain extent, manufactured statistics. I mean, this is the best we got to go on. But you know, you got some projections over here on this chart that shows that, that some people say the growth, and this was earlier, is much lower than what the Chinese are reporting. Bottom line is growth, their, their economy is not growing near as fast. So everything they need to do is going to be harder to do in a slower economy. And here are the things that they need to do. The author in the chapter talks about some of these things. And all of these are out there. So, you know, I think it's interesting. The China bubble. You know, this is cover of Time magazine. Uh, the, I think the date goes back to like 2014, something like that. I think that's what it is, maybe even 2012. So this has been talked about for quite some time, this China bubble. But here's the rundown of issues that they have to deal with. Economic reform is number one. I'll come back to that in a little bit. They got this economy that's out of balance. They got to figure out what to do with the state-owned enterprises, how to rein them in, how to reform the banking system, how to deal with this increased debt. You know, I talk about the debt down here, the debt problem that they have. How do they, how do they recover that? And what makes it even harder now, now that China has gotten richer, it's created more special interest in their country so to push back and reform against some of these industries, some of these special interests that are, have now gained some wealth, it's going to be a harder thing to do. All right, the demographic issue here, the one, two, four problem. You've heard this. You've got one child who supports two parents, who supports four grandparents. That's hard. In fact, I read that uh, this year, in one report, said the actual total population of China actually declined. I mean, to me, I think that's amazing when you think of the demographics here. You think China, I mean, you know, they got 1.4 billion people. You know, I know there's a lot of discussion. It won't be long before India becomes the most populous nation. But they are old. They're getting old. They're getting older before they are rich. So when you think about that per capita GDP and you're going to take care of your older population who are no longer working, who's going to do that? How do you afford that? That's a problem for them. Pollution is a big problem. This is one of these externalities when you have um, uh, some of this heavy industry. So the steel industry, 923 million metric tons. Do we want to bring all that back? You know, look at that picture of Pittsburgh. You know, look at that picture of picture Pittsburgh in the 1940s, and you go to Pittsburgh today, wow, what a beautiful city. You know, nice and clean, and all these high-tech industries. Medical, technology, Carnegie Mellon. Do we want to bring the steel industry and all the pollution back to the United States? I don't think so. We are bringing some of it back, by the way. But at any rate, pollution is a big problem there. Inequality is growing. Corruption is a big problem. These are the special interests that have been created. Trade tensions, you know, that's one that I added to this list recently. And then this big issue about urbanization. I mean, that's how they've gotten most of this growth. It's been the migrants that have gone to the cities to get into these new industries. 
But how do they deal with that? That is a huge problem. Because these migrants that go to Chinese cities, they don't have any rights. They can't put their kids in school. They can't go to the local health system. None of that because they've got a hukou. They've got this like internal passport system. And their hukou says, this is where you came from. If you want to put your kids in school, you've got to go back there. That's really tough. So that's, that's, you talk about social reform. This is a huge issue. And the people that live in these cities, you know, they say, well, wait, we, we don't want to pay for them. That's going to be, you know, our taxes are going to go up to increase our school systems. So we don't want to do that. So the social safety net is really pretty messed up in China. So a big problem for that. So here's Xi Jinping. And so the thought was that when he came in, okay, this guy's going to have enough power that he's going to really be able to push these reforms through. That's what everybody was initially thinking, the 2012, 2014 time frame. Well, that hasn't happened, but that's what's depicted here. The man who must change China. And this is a quote from him, came in from a speech from the Politburo, and you can read through that. He recognizes, you know, like I said, none of this is a surprise. They recognize that they have to do this. This is a huge issue for them to make these reforms happen. And then when you think about it, where is their legitimacy? I mean, sometimes, you know, we, our legitimacy of our government is based on our elections. Oh, well, maybe that's good or bad. But at any rate, that's another issue, another, another talk. But their legitimacy is based on economic growth. They've got to provide the goods to their people. What happens when economic growth slows down? How do you have a legitimate government in China? How do you deal with the social stability? You've got a rising middle class. You've got a rising upper, upper middle class. How do you satisfy their demands and wants? You want, to, you want to transition to a consumer-based economy, so you want to give them more choices as a consumer. Well, the argument always has been they're going to want more choices from a political perspective. They're going to want more say in their local government, all these other kind of things. Well, how do you deal with that in, the commun in communist China? And then you've got this huge, as I already mentioned, social underclass. Lots of issues, lots of problems in China. So keep that in the back of your mind when we start talking about some of these trade issues. All right, now let's talk about trade. So theory and practice. So there's your theory, you know, tariffs. The practice is, oh my gosh, that's going to make my beer cost more. So we're going to have a problem here. All right, so some of this is just real quick review. You know, why we like or why uh, free trade is good. Uh, absolute and comparative advantage. It's a more efficient use of resources. That's great. So it leads to more con uh, consumption. That's good. Greater variety, lower cost. Developed countries like it. You know, we can move into high-skilled jobs. Let these developing countries do the lower-skilled jobs, the polluting jobs, some of those other kind of things. So we like that. Uh, less developed countries like it because that gives them a chance to, to come up out of poverty, to do the same kind of industrialization that we did. And bottom line, everybody's happier, everybody's better off, so global prosperity increases. That's free trade. So how about for protectionism? You know, loss of government, re loss of government, government revenue. You know, tariffs uh, contribute a very, very small part to our overall government revenues. I was surprised... The president mentioned it in his State of the Union about how the Customs and Border Patrol, those are the folks that, that monitor the tariff system, how they've been taking in some money. But at any rate, I mean, you know, that's, that's relatively minor today. Didn't used to be. That used to be the number one source of government, government revenue. But when we passed the income tax law in, I don't know, 1912, 1910, or whenever it was, that's no longer the case. We're concerned about national security. There are some industries back to this commanding heights notion, that we want to keep under our control, or at least we want to have a significant amount of production in there. Even, even things like food security. That's why agricultural policy is so tough. When you talk about US, EU trade, uh, US, Japan trade, because you know, food security, we want to be able to feed our people. So national security is important. Infant industries, if you're just starting out, you want to be able to protect your industries like everybody else used to do. Uh, well, if they cheat, unfair competition. You got to do something against these cheaters. And then this loss of domestic jobs, lower wages. So there are winners, maybe Walmart, and the population in general, because we got access to greater amounts of goods at lower prices. But they're also losers. 
And, you know, we've seen that. I mean, you know, you just drive down Carlisle. There's still lots of empty storefronts uh, along the, the two main streets, High Street and Hanover Street. Now, the theory is that the winners, the gains for the winners are greater than the losses for the losers. So we ought to be able to compensate them. Unfortunately, the gains are very dispersed. You know, every one of us out there may gain, you know, theoretically, you know, $10 or whatever because, because of these of, of cheaper products. But the losses are very concentrated. So if there's somebody out here that's lost a job, well, you know, just because everybody else is gaining $10 and they've lost a job at $40,000, $50,000, that's hard. And so how do you compensate them? And so that's part of the problem. There is an uh, article in the current foreign affairs, really very good. So if you're interested in reading a short piece that goes in a little bit more depth on this, Alan Blinder's got this, the free trade paradox. You know, all economists like free trade. Right now, almost all politicians don't like it. You know, that's the paradox. And so he says, he makes this argument that, you know, economists used to think that what was really driving this was consumers. Consumers like cheap goods. So this is all about consumption. And now they're arguing, well, maybe it's not about the consumers. Maybe it's about the producers. We're not concerned with the well-being of consumers. We're concerned with the well-being of producers. So if the producers are doing better, that means they can keep jobs here. So jobs are more important. Well-paid jobs are more important than cheap goods. You know, that's part of the debate out there. So I think, like I said, I think this article lays it out very well. There was an editorial in yesterday's Wall Street Journal that's making the argument that the Democrats should uh, really take on this free trade issue uh, to push this as they move forward. We'll see. We'll see how the, how the politics of that play out. All right, so a couple other things to think about. So you got all that free trade background. That's led to this, you know, how do you think about what's your world view? So you got this liberal international order. Uh, great book here, The World American Made. You know, this is post-World War II. We put all this into place. So we want to support commercial liberalism, economic interdependence, liberal institutions. We got the IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization. We support all that. All that stuff plays out along those lines. You, you go down another level. So what does that mean for economic policies? What we call the Washington Consensus, not just because we like it, but Washington, uh, the World Bank headquarters is in Washington. The IMF headquarters is in Washington. They're all located, you know, within a couple blocks of the White House. And so that's collectively the Washington consensus is this is how, this is, this is what you do uh, to run a well-working economy, spelled out in uh, Friedman's Lexis and the Olive Tree. But the key down here is global integration. We want to support global integration. That's a good thing. So trade, minimize tariffs, open up trade, and also open up the free flow of capital. All that's supposed to converge, then lead to convergence across all of these different countries. OK, so then you got globalization. This is another contextual thing for, for when you think about trade and the, and the global economy. Uh, Friedman's second book, And the World is Flat, you got all these reasons why we've got globalization. Declining transportation, information technology. We've decreased trade barriers opened up capital markets. We've expanded the free market. You know, the end of the Cold War, big deal. Now, you know, China's on board, India's reforming, Russia's on Eastern Europe, Latin America, all of those new countries, all those new workers are out there in this globalized economy, new players, all this sort of thing. That's part, that's part of the background. We now have an integrated, we've integrated national economies. And so the good news of that, and this is another Friedman argument here, the Dell theory of conflict prevention. No two nations can go to war if they've got integrated supply chains. You just can't afford to do it, you know, because you're all connected. You know, so that's integrated supply chains. Another author talked about mutual assured production, replacing mutual assured destruction. So that's a good thing, globalization. And then you got manufacturing. Manufacturing has changed. You know, this was mentioned in the article, the smiley curve. So now we've got manufacturing as a commodity. It's disaggregated in supply chains. This is where China is primarily. All of this is changing. All of this is evolving. They're down there as the manufacturing lead and the assembly point, primarily the assembly point. But the real value in manufacturing today is in the smiley curve, the upward bend in the curve. 
it's the design, it's the front end, and then it's the back end. So everybody talks about moving up the value chain. We want to get more value in what we're doing. China, okay, this is good. This worked well for us. But now China wants to get up in here. They want to develop global brands. They want to be in the design. They don't just want to make it in China. They want to design it in China. Now, the other thing about these supply chains, and this has an impact when you think about the trade deficit. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. This trade and value added. You know, we give credit in terms of a, an input to our economy from the, the country, the last country of, of exit for that product. All of that value gets accounted to them. So an example here, you know, country B, they've got all of these import, inputs coming from various countries. We credit all of that value to this one country. Not all these intermediate inputs here that have an impact on that. So now we say, you know, so the prime example, you know, you got, I, you got an iPhone, I have an example of iPad. You know, there's only a minimum amount of value that China, all of these iPhones are coming from China, but there's only a minimum, a minimum amount of value that's actually added in China. All those components, they're made in the US, Germany, Japan, Taiwan, all kinds of places. And so the bottom line is our bilateral trade deficit if you take into account, and this is one of the things mentioned in the article, you know, this is another thing about these old-fashioned ways of doing accounting. Our bilateral trade deficit could be 35% less when we think of bilateral trade deficit with China. Not our overall deficit, but the bilateral deficit. So that's a big deal. Now, they're also, the economists, this is just a couple weeks ago, you know, we had globalization, and now they're talking about globalization. And, you know, transportation costs are not declining as much as they were anymore. Multinational corporations have higher costs for a number of reasons. They're putting a much higher priority on proximity to be able to customize production. So that's bringing some production home. Uh, services are more important, so services are not really that tradable. They're not the same as goods that you can put on a big container ship. Uh, and then there's been a lot of pushback and all of those kind of things. And so the bottom line is... You know, we could be looking at these integrated regions, North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. And to a large extent, that's already the case. I mean, the EU is ve obviously very integrated. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with Brexit, how it's going to play out. We got the USMCA. That's like the YMCA thing. You know, we could sing that song, but that's... So we got the USMCA replacing NAFTA. But that's a strength. I mean, you know, this, this manufacturing... Uh, economic hub in North America is very important to us. And so that's, that's this notion. And, and, and China already is in a position of increasing strength from an economic perspective. Okay, we've got this international organization, World Trade Organization, founded in 1995, some standard uh, principles. They've got a, a re, an enforcement mechanism, this dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, we are the respondent in a lot of cases, and we're also the complainant. So we're working that, and we'll come back to, to the World Trade Organization a little bit. Trade constraints. This is, you know, if you don't like free trade, what do you do as a nation? You can impose tariffs, but you get an idea here that tariff rates, average tariff rates, are very, very, very low. So tariffs is not such a big deal anymore, but there are all these non-tariff barriers. How nations can control access to their economy. And so that's, you know, just, just part of this contextual thing for trade. Uh, these are the five largest trading nations. The United States is number one. You know, we like to be number one. Most of that is because uh, we got a lot of imports. We're the number one importing nation. Then you get to see who the five are. These are our trading partners. These are the biggest trading partners for the United States. You'll notice that the dark blue bar, in most cases, is much bigger than the light blue bar. So that's why we have a trade deficit. But these are our big partners. Uh, China, number one. Canada and Mexico. There's part of that North America grouping, uh, numbers two and three. And then the rest of the usual suspects are lined up there. The U.S. current account, what our trade overall trade deficit is. So we're in deficit. Anything below this line here, the blue, the, between the blue and the red, that's a deficit. 
So really bad, not quite as bad. Uh, the red up here are services. So we run a surplus in services. We run a huge deficit when it comes to goods. And down here, about 2% of uh, GDP right now in deficit. All right, let's talk about this, this issue here. China versus the United States. So we're shooting each other in the foot. We'll see how that plays out. So here are our complaints in two broad categories. And this, you know, you can read the tweet. If you want to figure out what's going on in the United States, you've got to read the tweets, I guess. I mean, that's the way it works now, right? So, so you read this tweet from the president from April of this year, and he says, we're not in a trade war with China. We've already lost that war. But at any rate, what we've got a problem with, we've got a problem with the trade deficit, and we've got a problem with intellectual property theft. You know, this, you know, I'll expand on that a little bit. So issue number one, trade deficit. And there you see it. You know, projected for 2018, you know, it's not getting better, it's getting worse, $418 billion. So that's merchandise trade. So that's not the, the, the net current account. So, right, big, big bad number there, we're concerned about the deficit. But even more important is these structural issues. And so we are arguing that they are not complying. They got in the WTO in 2001, there were a lot of things that they were supposed to do. They were supposed to transition to a much more market-based economy, and they're not doing it. In fact, they're backtracking. Under Xi Jinping, they're backtracking. So uh, that's bad. They got all these distortions from these state-owned enterprises. They got all these subsidies. They're, they've got market access constraints. So all of that uh, has got our dander up. But then even more is this coerced technology transfer. If our companies want to work in China, They've got to agree to transfer their knowledge to Chinese joint venture firms, and we don't like that. We don't like that at all. Um, so, and they'll, they'll get technology any way they can. Physical, cyber theft, acquisition. And then to top it off, they started talking about Made in China 2025, this new industrial policy. And they are broadcasting that, and that has got us upset as well. So. Let's talk, first of all, about the left side of that. So two issues, deficit, structural. So let's talk about the deficit. So some reasons why the deficit, and most economists say, yeah, that's really not what you should be focused on in reality, these bilateral deficits. And so, so some of the consideration here, we already talked about this, this global value chain, uh, this value added that bilateral trade deficits, when you consider the movement of intermediate components, could really be anywhere from 25 to 50% less. So, you know, the numbers don't do justice to how the global economy is actually working today. So we gotta take that into consideration. And then the author uh, makes this point in the article, you know, even for those imp imports, there's a lot of things that, it creates a lot of jobs. I mean, we've got to transport those goods. We've got to warehouse those goods. We've got to provide all the retail in the United States. So that's the argument that 55 cents of every dollar of an import really goes to U.S. jobs. Uh, and then the economists, you know, their bottom line is, well, it's, it's not, you know, it's really not bad or good. You know, this is the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, that's how economists talk. So um, it's driven by domestic economic policy. We are... We are spending more money. We are buying more than we are making. And so a lot of that is this difference between national savings and domestic investment. There is a demand for investment in the United States, and we're not saving enough. And oh, by the way, our government clearly is not saving enough. Our government clearly is not saving at all. And so all of that goes into this demand for capital, foreign capital, to pay off our government deficit, to pay off this extra purchasing that we want to do. There's greater demands for capital to come in. We're going to get all that capital, then we have got the wherewithal to spend it, and we're going to go out and spend it. And so that's, that's part of this deficit. So if you really want to address, address the deficit, you've got to do things to enhance savings. So that means, in reality, that means you've got to force an appetite suppressant <laughs> down everybody, you know, just don't. Don't spend as much. Policies to increase savings, get a handle on government deficits, all those kind of things. And then we're back to global supply chains. You know, just real quick, this is what global supply chains used to look like. 
all of these countries providing goods to the United States. And now we've added, as I mentioned before when we were talking about the smiley curve, China is now in the middle of all that. All of these inputs go to China, China puts it together, it comes to the United States. So you look at this bottom chart here. We have always had a problem with importing a lot more than what we, or, or a greater amount of imports coming from the Pacific Basin. About 47% of our inputs. And so this is uh, 1990 and then 2017. 1990, 2017, 47, almost exactly the same amount. But now, most of it gets credited to China instead of all these other countries. So that's part of this distortion when you think about bilateral trade deficits. Okay, so that's the deficit. This is the big deal, I think. This is the structural issues here. And this is a great quote from the former Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, we're in a different kind of trade war. We're in an investment war, a technology war. And it's really going to, to, to spell out what's going to happen in the 21st century. Chip wars, the battle for digital supremacy. This is the commanding heights of the 21st century, in, in my view. And I think, as, as you see there, and a lot of other views as well. So we are really concerned about this made in China 2025. China's figured it out. Like I said, you know, none of this is top secret. China knows that. They want to go up the value chain. They know that these technologies are important. And they don't just want to be the assembler. They want to be the designer. They want to control. And so China, uh, made in China 2025 is, you know, they're, they're going to drive innovation. Not just made in China, invented in China. They want, they want these global uh, production chains to really be uh, driven by Chinese industry, not so many out, outside components. Uh, and, and state involvement. And so we are very upset. They, they've got these quotas out here about the percent that they want made in China, invented in China. And that says, oh, well, you're going to close out the Chinese market. Now, you know, if I was in China, this is based on, made in China 2025 is based on a German program, Industry 4.0. You know, so the Germans, you know, they're, when we talk about a mercantilism, you know, the Germans have got a little strain of mercantilism running through. So Germany came up with this program, Industry 4.0, that says we want to be out there on the forefront of all these new manufacturing technologies, these new manufacturing techniques. And the Chinese say, hey, that sounds good to us. So they put out, you know, uh, Made in China 2025, and everybody throws up the red flag. But at any rate, that's just the way it is. So we're not too excited about that. Oh, there it is. There's Germans Industry 4.0. I thought that was a hidden slide. But anyway, so they're after our technology by hook or crook. And so foreign direct investment, mergers and acquisitions, force transfer, cyber, physical. We're concerned about the security of our supply chains. There's little intermediate components. How do we make sure they're secure? And it's not just the United States. You know, so that's why I put it China's designs for Europe. So this is, I also think this is interesting, you know, that the, the cover there that China's buying up the world, that's from 2010, so none of this is new. And so now, I mentioned Germany. So Germany came up with this Industry 4.0, just announced two days ago, they've got a new national industrial strategy, National Industrial Strategy 2030. And they're saying that if they've got industries that are under threat of foreign acquisition, the government is going to step in and take a stake and sort of prevent that. Well, sounds a little bit like China. Sounds a little bit about merc mercantilism. So here's the example, you know, sort of the poster child, uh, Huawei. I mean, it's all over the news today. You know, once again, you know, the cover of, of, of The Economist was back, who's afraid of Huawei security threats? 2012, seven years ago, we're worried about them, and we're still even more worried about them. And you see this chart down here, part of that is, because now they are the largest uh, manufacturer, largest company involved in mobile network infrastructure. That's what you see over here. That's the 5G network. They're out there on the front end. So we're concerned about what Huawei's up to. Big firm, right? Big firm. Links to China. You know, they passed this law a couple years ago, the new Chinese law compelling private firms to assist the state if they get asked. So if you're operating in China and you get asked to provide some information, they got to do it. 
Then there's this other notion here. There was an article by Michelle Flanoy just a couple, uh, just a week or so ago, talking about civil military fusion. Private academic technology research must be shared with the PLA. You know, that sort of gets the hair on the back of our necks standing up. So we're not excited about that. And then this growing reaction. You know, you've read about that. So this is, this is why this is 2012. The US Congress back in 2012. So folks, this is not a Trump thing. Okay, we've been working this for quite some time. This is, this is you know, you, you talk about you want bipartisanship. Well, these kind of issues, you're going to get bipartisanship. Now, whether that's good or bad, that's another issue. But anyway, so it goes back to 2012. You got this arrest of the, of the, uh, the CFO, an extradition request in, in uh, Canada. Poland arrested a couple Huawei employees for espionage. It's restricted access, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan, under review in the UK, Germany, uh, the EU. So this is not just a US thing. Everybody is starting to take a look at this, and we're concerned. Uh, this is really you know, the case for action. And this just came out uh, two days ago. You know, this is, this is our trade negotiator. Wouldn't you hate to run into him as your car salesman? <laughs> Man, he just looks tough. Whew, can't negotiate with that guy. So anyway, so this is, this is a US uh, trade uh, representative report to Congress saying this is to the WTO. So this is another issue that I think is interesting. You know, everybody thinks, oh, wow, you know, US, we don't play with international organizations anymore. We backed away. Well, not really. In fact, we are going through the WTO to really make the case for what our concerns are. And so this is you know, part of it. You know, they failed to follow the rules. They're not playing by the games. This is a rules-based system. They're not playing. They're cheating. So what are we going to do? We're going to impose tariffs. We're going to go to the WTO. And we are going to the WTO in conjunction with the EU and Japan. We're going to complain about it. We're going to try to get the WTO to do something. That's part of our concern, uh, to make sure they do it. We're going to impose investment controls so that we're going to protect our critical American technology, just like that German plan that just was announced. They, you know, people are figuring this out. And we got the Department of Justice uh, started a new China initiative. So we're going to take legal action against these folks. So that's what we're doing. Uh, by the way, you know, this has nothing to do with trade. This is all legal stuff. Believe that, and we've got a bridge in Brooklyn. And so Chinese vulnerabilities, real quick, let me go through some of this. You know, so if you're China, you know, trying to figure out you know, the question earlier, well, how's this going to all play out? I don't have the slightest idea how it's going to play out. I'm not really on Twitter, so I don't know the latest. But at any rate, so uh, tariffs. So if you think about it, Chinese exports you know, to America are 4% of their GDP. Our exports to China are 06 this is what we export, about $130 billion. They export 505. Looks like a little asymmetric advantage for the United States. Leverage, potential leverage. Uh, investment controls. We've already got things that are in place. CFIUS, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, recently updated by FIRMA, Foreign Investment Risk Review Management. I forget what the A is. But anyway, I did pretty good on the first five. So, so we've got investment controls so that we can control that. Uh, export controls. This is another thing. Every time, and you know, I showed that picture real quickly of me in Shanghai. So uh, a colleague and I and uh, four students went to China in 2017, and we're talking about these issues. And, and every place we went to the different think tanks and whatnot, universities, the Chinese will come up to you and they'll say, we wouldn't have a trade deficit if you would sell us the stuff that we want to buy. And we had a, we had a, a meeting. Uh, the Strategic Studies Institute met with a group of officers from the PLA in December this year. Same comment that I got. If you would sell us what we want to buy, if you, if you wouldn't have these export controls, it wouldn't be a problem. And then you got, so, but there is reliance on imports too. So I don't know if you remember back in, in the last spring, ZTE, another big telecom company, because they had a, a violated sanctions, our sanctions policy, we said, okay, you can't buy US products. They were going to go bankrupt because they were so dependent on chips, uh, licensed agreements for chips and some of these kind of things. We, we backed off uh, at the last moment. But that just points out some of their vulnerabilities. And then we can weaponize 
We don't have enough time to get into this, but this is a huge issue. We can weaponize the global financial system, and that's based on the dominance of the U.S. dollar. If you want to, you know, that, all that global stuff that I showed up there in this new global economy, it's really all based on the U.S. dollar. And so much of that links back to U.S. banks. So we can weaponize that. That's a huge advantage for us, a huge vulnerability for China. They know about it. Everybody knows about it. Even the Europeans are a little bit upset right now. The Europeans are pushing back because of our Iranian sanctions. They want to continue to do business in Iran, but they can't do it under the current global financial system. So they're trying to come up with a workaround. Huge issue. And we do have a little bit of a united front. OK, here's our remedies. Uh, you know, we got all these existing laws, Section 201. Uh, this is the safeguard. This is what we use for solar cells and washing machines. Section 232, this is the National Security Clause. This is what we use for steel imports and aluminum. Uh, we might use it for cars, uh, uranium, so those are still being studied. The big one for China was Section 301, and that says, hey, you know, you're violating agreements and all these other kind of things, and so that's what we really used against these Chinese imports. So here's the current score. We got three rounds. You know, we started out with $50 billion of Chinese uh, imports in the United States with tariffs, 25%. We added another 200 billion, uh, and that's at 10%. And this is where the negotiations started. The 10% was supposed to go to 25% on the 1st of January. And everybody said, OK, let's call truce. Let's back off. And so we backed off. The China has retaliated with tariffs on up to 110%. So you look over here, uh, 250 versus 110. They've got about, what is that number? You know, they've got about uh, $25 billion to play with. Wow, we've got $267 billion to play with. So if you look at this from a Chinese perspective, they are about out of Schlitz. <laughs> I, I mean, that's where our leverage is. So, you know, and we can get into this issue about tariffs, but that's leverage for us. OK, here's their secret weapon. This is uh, our youngest daughter. She got married to this guy in May. He is an almond farmer in California. They call them almonds in Northern California, by the way. That's a trivia question for you. Uh, their big, his big investor where he sells his almonds is to China. So if they block, and they have, they have put tariffs on here, but this is American almonds in China, it could really start to get personal. So now, we're, you know, now I could get concerned. OK, how's all this going to work out? Let me try to go through this real quick. Uh, you know, we got this power transition. We want to avoid the Thucydides trap. You got a rising power. You know, this is China. This is the status quo power. And Thucydides says that's what caused the Polynesian War. You know, rising power Athens upset Sparta. And it, that's just the way the international system works. We want to avoid the Thucydides trap. That's what we're going to try to do. You know, this is not new. You know, we got this American fear of Asian powers. So whether it's Godzilla or it's the panda bear, that's part of the issue. And uh, so, you know, you're not going to have time to read this, but it's a neat little quote about, oh my gosh, we've got all these problems in the United States. Our economy's on the, you know, tanking out. Our industry's bad. Everything's bad. You, you know, you could think that was pretty recent. It's actually 1992. The coming war with Japan. And here was our concern. You look at this chart. Wow. In the 90s, the Japanese economy was up to 71% of the U.S. economy. Remember that number? What's the Chinese economy today? About 70% of the US economy. It didn't work out the way we thought it might work out. So that's the problem with doing long-term projection. I'm not saying this is going to play out with China. There's, there's nobody that says this is what's going to happen. But we've been there and done that. And we have been there and done that. And so you think about this. Japan was the dress. This is a great book, by the way. It's in the, uh, the suggested readings in this particular article. Really very good. So when you think about Asia Pacific, it's not just about China. Japan is a huge player. And we got a, obviously, we have a huge history here, you know. Uh, but this was a huge crisis for us in the 1980s, in the early 1990s. We've been through all of this with China, and that's what, or Japan. You know, back then, you know, that's, Japan was the world's most successful communist country. That's what we used to think about, you know, because they are a much bureaucratic, their governmental system is different than ours. You know, you've got the Liberal Democratic Party that ran the country forever, with the exception of about four years. 
and they've got much more control industrial policy. They got the Ministry of International Trade and Industry that, that they've actually changed the name, but that's what it was back then. All these things were going on with China. If you remember, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you think about China and, you know, you know what we got from China was cheap junk, you know, little toys and all that kind of stuff. So uh, now we're into this, you know, they got into this technology theft. There was an article in this week's Economist talking about how manufacturing is coming back to the United States. And it, and it related back to this Japan thing. And it said, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, Japan was stealing us blind. So we've been there, done that, and this was our response. Semiconductors was the big issue. Wow, does that ever ring a bell? The chip war, the technology war that we're in today. That was the big issue in the 1980s. We pushed back, we cut this deal, we forced Japan into it. We had the Plaza Accord on managed evaluation of the currencies and uh, voluntary export results. So what happened? You saw that chart, 70% down to 20%. The Japanese say, they don't blame us. They say that they overreacted in flooding their market with, uh, with, with credit in response to their uh, appreciation of the currency. The Chinese have a little bit different take, it on, take on it. They say, we, we, we were watching. We know what you did to, Ch to Japan. And you purposely beat down a competitor. We're not going to let that happen to us. We're not going to let it happen to China. Uh, so Xi Jinping, this is what he's all about. The China dream, Belt Road, the community of common destiny. And he's really made the state sector much stronger and bigger. And that's who we're up against. We thought, we thought China, if they're integrated in this global economy, they're going to be a responsible stakeholder. They're going to liberalize. Well, it hasn't worked. How the West got China wrong. That's, that's the concern. So what's going to happen to China? Another great book, China's Future by, by David Shambaugh. Uh, his projection is that it's going to move towards hard authoritarianism probably was soft authoritarianism, uh, authoritarianism. Now it's going to move to hard. You look down here, limited reforms, limited reforms, stagnation, and decline. And if you think about the things that Xi Jinping is doing, it's moving towards that direction. What are our options? We can, uh, we can work through institutional fix. We can decouple, disengage, constructive dialogue. Uh, none of this is going to be easy. You know, this is Vice President Pence's speech in October. Really interesting about how he, you know, slammed China. Uh, but China's a much different, you know, when you think about the new Cold War, China's a much different animal, and our relationship with China is not anywhere near the same as the U.S. relationship and the world's relationship with the Soviet Union. So it's going to be hard. So we could do this. We could try to diversify supply chains. We are doing that to a certain extent. A lot of companies do this China plus one. They want to stay in China but they're going to start to invest elsewhere to expand, to diversify their production. Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, Philippines, any of these other number of places. Trade blocks, I talked about the trade block. We can restrict investment and our security policies, how we're going to work that. The bottom line, this is the last slide, so uh, everybody can take a deep breath. Um, so people, I mean, they argue that in, in reality, so you know, how's this all going to play out? Uh, the argument is that really for both China and the United States, the key arena is not this international stuff. It's really domestic. So for Xi Jinping, it's really what happens in China, what he needs to do to maintain the lid on 1.4 billion people with these different social pressures that are building in their country. In the United States, the argument is as well, yeah, okay, we're, we're, we're worried about China, but it, it, in reality, it's what we do at home that really matters. It's what we do to our domestic economy. And you can read through this you know, litany of books here, 2008, 2015, Joe Nye, uh, Graham Allison, you know, Destined for War, this is the Thucydides Trap update. You know, they all argue their bottom line is what's we do, what we do in the United States. We got this big, you know, we are an innovation-based economy, lots of money on R&D. We got cheap energy, a huge plus for us. We got to get our education system squared away. We got to figure out immigration. Immigration is a huge plus for us in terms of bringing in brain power, bringing in workers. 
Uh, we got to get our infrastructure figured out, regulation. Made, we've made some big progress in some of the regulation, and then we got to get our political act together. So it's really a domestic issue here. So with that, uh, I'm sorry that I've taken so long, so we'll probably give you a, a short in-place break like you did last time, and then we'll get into Q&A. Thanks a lot.